Okay, welcome to a new user space has entered this talk. We're going to discuss how we integrated RISC-V hardware features such as PMP um, that support into the Zephyr real-time operating system. Thank you for joining us at Embedded Linux Conference. Thank you for watching, listening, joining, wherever you may be. First, let's do a couple quick introductions. Um, we work for Baylib, which is an embedded software consultancy based in the south of France. We have around 40 software engineers uh, with a strong open source focus. Uh, so we are active in the Linux kernel community. Um, we've often been in the top 20 kernel contributors. We have several maintainers. Um, but we're also maintainers and collaborators in the Zephyr operating system as well. Um, we also are quite active in U-Boot, ARM Trusted Firmware, Opti, several Yocto layers, um, automated testing, OTA updates, and so on. So Alex Mernia is uh, the primary author and engineer behind this work. Um, he is based in, this, in Nice, France area, and uh, his expertise here is in the RISC-V user space and PMP, which is the primary subject of this talk. Um, he did all of the core engineering for this work. Um, I am just presenting that work. Um, and uh, my name is Kevin. I am a co-founder and senior engineer at Baylib. Um, I'm primarily a Linux kernel developer and maintainer. Um, I do live in Seattle, um, but I have contributed a little bit to Zephyr. I, I have one patch in Zephyr. It happens to be a grammar fix, but it's still a patch in Zephyr. So there, I at least have some credibility in Zephyr. Um, but actually, Alex is the, is the primary engineer behind this work. So a brief agenda overview. So first I'm going to introduce a handful of Zephyr features and terminology that, we'll, that we um, will cover in the talk um, and then give a little introduction to some RISC-V hardware features that are relevant to what we needed to implement and then talk a bit how we did user mode threads and protected memory. Um, and then a little bit on some challenges that we ran into and uh, which led to some ideas for some future work. So with that, we can get into the work. So first, let's talk a little bit about Zephyr, um, introduce some of the features. So first of all, for um, the embedded Linux crowd. Uh, Zephyr is another operating system. It's a Linux Foundation project, but it's a real-time operating system focused on typically smaller types of uh, cores that Linux might uh, would run on. Um, so uh, in this case we're talking about some small uh, microcontroller class uh, chips that Zephyr is targeted at for this work. Um, so uh, one of the concepts of Zephyr that will be familiar to Linux users is the notion of privilege mode. So Zephyr, uh, just like Linux, has kernel mode and user mode. Um, except unlike uh, Linux, Zephyr uh, has user mode is actually optional. So you can run everything in kernel mode for on the types of cores that don't have any privilege separation. Um, so Zephyr... Um, by default, the kernel will run in the highest as the highest privilege level uh, is where the kernel mode is, and that's where the Zephyr OS uh, kernel is running. Um, as well as kernel threads can run in this level, so um, this is kind of the default configuration for Zephyr for types of chips that only have a single privilege mode. Um, but what we're interested in for this talk is adding an unprivileged user mode support for RISC-V cores that actually have uh, hardware support for that. So um, this is where we can add support for this Zephyr user mode threads um, so that threads can be protected from each other with some hardware protection, um, such as a memory protection unit. Um, so throughout this talk, I will uh, you'll see this little Zephyr flag with some uh, links. 
So if you want to look at the slides later, all these links will take you to Zephyr, uh, the official Zephyr documentation, which will go into more details on each of these topics. Um, so the Zephyr documentation actually is quite good on the internals, uh, so uh, I'm giving a quick overview of the Zephyr features. Um, but uh, the documentation is quite good, so you can dig on your own here with these links. So another um, feature of Zephyr that we'll be getting into is just how Zephyr does stacks and stack separation. So there's two concepts here uh, that are referred to a little differently in the docs. So the first is stack separation, where each thread has its own stack. Um, and that stack also includes thread local storage. So all the memory and data that's specific to the thread is, is stored uh, in the TLS section, which is kind of combined in Zephyr uh, along with its thread stack. So combining these stack separation with hardware support, such as an MPU, um, we can support what Zephyr calls MPU-backed user space. So that's basically memory protection of user space uh, threads against each other and from the kernel as well, so that threads can't tinker with uh, the kernel. Um, another concept in Zephyr uh, that's called stack protection, and that uh, encompasses a couple things. Uh, so that's hardware stack overflow. Um, and that's, again, where the we, we can use the MPU to actually detect uh, accesses outside of the normal stack region. Um, and for that's an optional feature in Zephyr, like m most of these things are optional at compile time. Um, so if you don't want to have, if you don't want or use hardware stack protection, there's a software alternative as well using stack canaries um, that can be implemented as well using, uh, com with some compiler support. So um, later on we'll talk more about the, the hardware backed features because that's what we're interested in for this talk for, for RISC-V. So another concept in Zephyr um, that uh, terminology-wise might not be similar to, uh, from if you're familiar with Linux, is the notion of memory domains. So by default, uh, user mode thread in Zephyr um, only have access to the minimum, a uh, minimum set of regions. So obviously they need access to the uh, executable text region, the read-only data, and as well as a stack. Um, which includes the thread local storage. So that's kind of the minimum, the bare minimum that a user space thread needs. However, if you want to do things like shared memory between threads or have a memory region that's shared between the kernel and a uh, user mode thread, uh, Zephyr provides a memory domain API. Um, and that can be used either at build time or at runtime to define regions that are shared then between threads and uh, the kernel or between, yeah, between threads or between a thread and the kernel. And this can also, this can be MPU back, so this can be uh, just like the other region can be enforced by the MPU so that um, accesses outside of domains, memory domains that you have access to will fault or trap. Um, but uh, a little bit of foreshadowing for the talk, the, for MPU-backed regions, we need to be careful because uh, some MPUs, especially some of these smaller microcontrollers, have, even if they have MPU, there's a limited number of regions that can be protected. So we have to be aware of that as well when using the memory domain API. But we'll get into that in a little more detail as well. Okay, also potentially familiar to Linux users is uh, kconfig. So Zephyr, uh, Zephyr is configured at build time using kconfig just like the Linux kernel. And here's a handful of options um, that are involved in the features that we're talking about here. So um, the one thing to note here is user space itself can be configured, uh, enabled or disabled in Zephyr. Um, so this is the case where you, if you don't have any privilege levels, you don't have any need for a separate user space. Uh, so that can be turned on and off. And all these features can be turned on and off at compile time, including the memory domains that I just talked about, um, power of two alignment for various regions, and MPU support. All these things are optional in Zephyr. OK, 
Okay, so that's a quick overview of the Zephyr kind of terminology and landscape for the features that are relevant to what we're what we're after for this talk. So now let's move on to Risk Five, um, some Risk Five hardware features that are involved with what we want to implement. So first of all, in Risk Five. Um, has hardware privilege modes. So in the RISC-V spec, there are a few privilege modes that are defined, the first of which is machine mode. And machine mode is the highest privilege level, um, and that's the only privilege level that's required in the RISC-V spec. Um, so the before we started our work, the Zephyr port to RISC-V uh, supported this mode only, and that's where the kernel and threads all ran in machine mode, so at the highest privilege level. Um, so there's no switching between privilege modes, and that supports RISC-V cores that only have you know this machine mode. Um, so this is the minimum mode, and that's kind of the base basic RISC-V port uh, to Zephyr. We'll use this uh, even before we started our work. Um, so an additional feature, additional privilege mode defined in the RISC-V spec is called supervisor mode. So again, this is an optional part of the spec, um, and this is common. This is a, a mode that's not present in a lot of the common embedded designs, uh, RISC-V designs that are out there now. So for example, the sci 5 E family, like the E31 and, and so on, um, these cores do not have a supervisor mode. However, the next mode, user mode or U mode, uh, another one of the optional mode, uh, this is common in the embedded RISC-V uh, designs such as the Sci-5E family and a few other RISC-V designs out there. And so this is the mode that we focus on for this talk um, and this is where we add support for user mode threads. Um, if you're familiar with the Linux port for RISC-V, um, Linux uses these modes a little bit differently. So Linux actually runs, the Linux kernel itself runs in supervisor mode on the RISC-V port. Um, and he, uh, the Linux port runs in supervisor mode. Um, what runs in machine mode is uh, um, the supervisor binary interface. So there's a project called OpenSBI, which implements kind of the, some low-level uh, features of RISC-V. So that runs in machine mode. The Linux kernel runs in supervisor mode, and then threads in a user space runs in user mode. But for Zephyr, um, the Zephyr kernel will run in machine mode, and uh, the user mode threads that we implement will now run in user mode. So the way that uh, switching to different privilege modes works, uh, just like in um, Linux, is to trap. So there's a special, inst there's an RISC-V instruction called eCall, which is used, uh, uh, which the, all the system calls and switching is implemented on top of. So that's, for example, how we trap from an unprivileged mode into a higher privileged mode is using the eCall instruction. So we'll get into those details in a little bit as well. Okay, so um, for the MPU, for the memory protection unit in RISC-V, um, the RISC-V terminology for this is physical memory protection. So this is referred to as PMP in the RISC-V spec. So like most things RISC-V, this also is an optional part of the spec. Um, I have a link here to the spec where this is defined. It's, it's, uh, there's, a there's a second volume of the RISC-V spec that defines the privileged, uh, privileged architecture where this is discussed. Um, but this is an optional part, so uh, of course it's required to do protected memory, but it may not be available on the RISC-V core you have. So. Um, uh, that's uh, you, that's the first thing to check, actually, if you want to see if this work is relevant to your RISC-V design. So the PMP, the goal of the PMP is to validate and check all the accesses from supervisor and user mode um, to make sure that they're, uh, they're actually allowed. Um, so the... Um, actually accesses from M mode, from machine mode, the high privilege modes are actually configurable, so you can have it um, in RISC-V, you can actually validate accesses from M mode as well, if you like. Um, so at a high level, um, 
the PMP basically can grant accesses to supervisor in user mode, or it can be used to just revoke accesses from machine mode. Um, so there's two different ways it can be used there. Because by default, machine mode has access to everything, but you could use the PMP to revoke access to certain areas from machine mode as well. Um, there's a special bit called the modify privilege bit um, in the PMP settings where this can be used to actually, when you switch from modes, you can actually set this bit if you want to check privileges from the previous mode. So this is useful in s for some implementations of fault handling and so on. Um, uh, I won't get into the details there, but that's, that's a, it's a useful kind of implementation detail for the RISC-V um, OS port. Um, the thing that I want to highlight here, and we'll, we'll hit on a few times during the talk, is basically this number of PMP entries. Um, so the RISC-V spec defines the number of PMP slots, the number of PMP entries actually as 16, um, but it's actually implementation dependent. So each of the RISC-V cores that are out there can choose how many PMP slots. So more commonly in cores that we've worked with, um, that's that number of slots has actually been half that has been eight so for example the sci 5 e cores that we worked with in this project they all have only eight pmp slots so as we'll see shortly that becomes uh, quite limiting um, for uh, for the features we want to implement or the regions that we want to protect with the pmp So each PMP entry in RISC-V is actually configured with two registers. So one's an 8-bit register that defines uh, read-write-execute permissions, as well as a few bits that define the type of entry that it is. So um, there are a handful of different types that are available. Uh, one is to the on-off to disable the, the entry altogether. TOR is top of region. Um, NA4 is for a naturally aligned 4-byte access, and NAPOT is a naturally aligned power of 2 region. So we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, because um, a few of those will, are relevant to our implementation here. So that's the config register, and then there's a 32-bit address register that's used to define the, the, um, the address th of the region. Um, and depending on the type, that address is used in different ways. So that's a 32-bit address register on the cores that we're talking about for this project. But of course, for uh, RV64 designs, that would be a 64-bit addre address register. So for the general case, if you want to use, uh, if you want to protect some arbitrary memory region that's contiguous, um, you actually have to use two PMP entries. So you use one entry for the start address, and then you use one entry for the end address. Um, and so uh, here we start to see already if you only have uh, a small number of PMP slots, we're limited to the number of uh, memory regions that we can actually define for protection in the PMP. However, um, there is a special case. If the region you want to protect is a naturally aligned power of two, then you use one entry for the starting address. And then uh, in the address register, there's a special way to set up a mask um, in the least significant bits to indicate the size of the, the power of two size. So in that case, um, if you define the regions that are you want to protect in the right way and they are naturally aligned, you can limit the number of um, PMP entries that you would use. So that's a quick overview of the RISC-V hardware features that we are used. So um, with the Zephyr background and the RISC-V hardware background out of the way, we can get into the implementation details. Okay, so one of the first things we need to do to implement uh, a user space in Zephyr 
for a new architecture is first to detect what privilege mode we're in. So the Zephyr API provides this function arches user context, um, which just returns true if the CPU is running within uh, user mode or and returns false otherwise. So unfortunately on risk five, there's not a simple implementation of this because we can't check the current mode um, from any privilege level. So from machine mode, we can always check the privilege level uh, or the, the register that keeps track of this is accessible in, in machine mode, but it's not in user mode. So we need to, first thing we need to do is figure out a way to, to be able to check whether we're running in user mode from user mode. So the, the obvious first, uh, first try was to just use a system call for this. Uh, so we you use eCall to trap into kernel mode and check what the previous uh, mode was and then return. Um, and that, we implement that first. It was the obvious way to do it. And what we noticed right away is this function, this Arches user context is actually used in quite a few places um, and was just adding a tremendous amount of overhead. So there are system calls happening every time this was called. Um, and so it just ended up slowing things down. So we looked for another way to do this and the way we ended up with was just using a global variable um, or a, a global region uh, where we set a flag uh, and this flag is, is user. And so um, that can be checked from both user mode and from kernel mode. And this uh, is just a, a four byte region that we protect with the PMP. So the smallest region you can actually protect with the MPU is a four byte region. Um, so we make this region uh, read only from user space and it's read write from kernel mode. So from user space, we can just read this variable and find out uh, what our current state is. And then it's uh, once we enter and exit kernel mode, we update this flag. So this ends up to be significantly faster, obviously, than doing a system call every time we want to check this value. However, um, with our limited number of PMP entries, we we have to use this. We already are using one of them just to implement this uh, this little global variable. Um, but that's the way it's designed for now. Um, so we'll get into this for future topics. But uh, this is a potential area of revisiting this implementation. So um, getting into, so now that we can detect uh, the, the current privilege mode, um, we get into system calls. So before we started this work, before we added a privileged user mode support, um, their system call infrastructure was already implemented for, for Zephyr on RISC-V. Um, because system calls are used even from kernel mode, um, and so as mentioned, they're built on top of this trap handler, this e-call. So the e-call, um, this trap handler uh, can be used from kernel mode as well. Um, and it's used for a few different things. It's used to trigger context switches. So even between kernel threads um, can be initiated by other, by the operating system. And so those are built on top of kernel mode system calls. So there, when that's, um, oh, and uh, um, the kernel mode system calls are also used to handle the IRQ offload. So that's Zephyr terminology for um, what in Linux would be called soft IRQs or, or work queues, um, kind of deferred work, um, deferred work that's initiated by an interrupt handler. So um, those things were already present um, before we started our work. So this is the system call infrastructure was in place uh, for the Zephyr port for RISC-V already. So um, now we'll talk about what we added, uh, what was needed to add user mode support to the system call infrastructure for, for RISC-V. So um, the first thing is just how to, how to initiate a system call from, from user space. So um, from user mode running on the thread stack, um, what is used is a system call wrapper. So Zephyr API defines uh, the system call wrappers already. To, uh, and so for each architecture, you need to implement these arch syscall invoke functions um, that, that uh, trigger system calls with various numbers of arguments. 
So those functions are built on top of this eCall instruction, which then traps into kernel mode or machine mode, or specifically on Risk Five. <coughs> So once we trap into the kernel kernel mode, um, the first thing that happens is switching from the the user stack to the kernel stack, um, and so we save the exception stack um, and various parts of SOC context, and then um, we update this flag. So this is this is user flag that I just talked about. So this is our special kind of protected area um, that we use to detect. Uh, to keep track of whether we're in um, user mode or kernel mode. So um, we update that. So now we update that false. So because we're running in, in kernel mode, um, and then we check if the this eCall trap actually came from kernel mode or not. So as, we, as I just mentioned, there's some infrastructure already in place for kernel mode system calls. So we first check that and then handle those cases. So um, like I mentioned, these these are there for um, for um, kernel mode syscalls, um, but there's also the the way to switch from kernel mode back into user mode. Like on thread start, for example, we switch from kernel mode to user mode. There's a f uh, function, a system call that does that. Um, also, system call returns from user from kernel mode back to user space go through here. Um, so we first handle any kernel mode system calls, and then we get into actually user mode system calls. So the way that's implemented now is we, once we get this far, we um, go and find the system call arguments that came from user space. So those are going to be in the exception stack frame. Um, so we load the arguments, we load the system call ID and validate all those to make sure it's a valid system call. And there's some basic checking done on the arguments. Um, to make sure they're all valid arguments, and then we actually trigger the system call. So this do syscall is kind of the generic Zephyr interface to, that handles, that does all the system call, the actual work of the system call. Um, when that's done, the system call return path does a nested e-call, and so we end up we end up back in the um, in this part here where the the e-call actually comes from kernel mode. Um, uh, we handle the system call return, um, and then we set our user is user flag back to true right before we return to user space. So now our variable is updated. So next time we check what mode we're in, we're now back into user mode. Okay, so. Adding on top of that now, um, we have the basic system call infrastructure in place. Um, now we can discuss how threads are actually implemented. So for a user thread, um, there's a few pieces here. So we'll talk about kind of the memory regions involved in a thread. So the first one, um, or the first couple that are the obvious ones are the program text section and the read-only data. Um, that come from the, the basic compilation of a, a, a user mode thread. Um, in Zephyr, these are actually combined by the linker script, so they become one region, um, and so the permissions are read and execute. Um, these should uh, be separated so that you could have the text section be executable only and the read-only data obviously should be read-only. Um, but as mentioned, with the limited number of PMP regions that can be protected, the current implementation actually combines these together, and so they have read and execute permissions for, for this combined area. So that's the first region. The second region is the thread stack um, that's separated from the text and data. So the thread stack um, that's, uh, that's per thread includes the thread local storage and also uh, thread ha threads have their own um, additional thread data and uh, BSS sections that are in this area. So um, that all gets put on the thread stack and uh, with permissions set accordingly. So for each of these, um, so those two two regions, uh, those have to be each get their own PMP entry, 
Um, and so by default, these are not necessarily aligned. So the text and data obviously can be arbitrary size and the thread stack um, can be defined at compile time. So unless these are aligned power of two, each of them needs two PMP entries. Um, so uh, that's already four PMP entries used for those. Um, combined, now we add in the global variable that we just talked about, this is user flag. Um, that uses one more PMP entry. So just to implement kind of a basic infrastructure for threads for arbitrary sized regions, we're already using five PMP entries of the eight total on cores like the E31. So as you can see, this is kind of the, uh, we start to see the, the limitations of a limited number of, of PMP slots. And so far we're just talking about user threads. Um, now, if we add on top of that the, the memory domains, um, those threads, remember threads can also ask for memory domains that can be shared between threads or shared with the kernel. Um, and so the, the, the number of um, memory domains is also limited. Uh, the number of memory domains that we can protect is limited by the remaining number of PMP slots. So there's a Zephyr API function. The first thing we want to know is how many partitions, actually memory domain partitions, we can, um, there are available. So that, that function just returns the, the, number, the max number of PMP slots available to the architecture um, minus the number that would be used by user space. Um, so that would be the you know, 8 minus 5 in the current design. Um, but if user space uh, is using power of 2, we can actually bring that down. So, uh, but we'll get in that in a second. So the next uh, API function is how to add a memory domain. So again, memory domains can be requested at build time or compile time, but they can be of arbitrary size. So if we want arbitrary size memory domains, um, then we need to use two PMP p entries for each memory domain partition. Um, and of course we only need one if it's a naturally aligned power of two, but since that is not enforced, uh, we have to take care there. So um, in, the, in the case where we're not using the naturally aligned power of two, we already are using five for user space um, and two for the first memory partition. Um, so that means we've used seven of eight. So because we need two for each memory partition, there's no more room for any memory partitions either. So just with a basic configuration of user space enabled plus a single memory domain partition, we've already used up all of our uh, PMP slots. Well, all but one, um, but we can only, we have to use two at a time. So we're basically, we're effectively out. Um, so um, one more function in the memory domain partition API is this arch buffer validate function. So what, what that's available, that, will, um, that can be called from threads to see if the thread actually has access to a, to a, uh, a memory domain partition, uh, either access or write access. Um, and then what that function actually does is just walks the PMP entries to, to check if the thread can access that or not. So, right, so we are, um, as I mentioned, we're heavily limited by the number of PMP slots. So uh, one of the things that we did in our implementation is um, to kind of, if user space is enabled, we, we use kconfig basically to automatically enable this power of two by default. So that allows uh, everything to be, all these regions we just discussed to be by default aligned on a power of two. Of course, you can configure um, you can configure this out if you like, but this is just the defaults that are in, in by default now. So once user space is aligned or is enabled, the power of two feature is enabled. The power of two alignment feature uh, is enabled so that we can maximize the number of available um, PMP entries. But the, the memory domain partitions are not, uh, not necessarily a compile time, so you still have to take care when you define your memory domain partitions to make those align on a power of two as well to, uh, if you want to use and protect several of those regions.
So that's the basics on um, user mode threads with some with memory domain protection. Um, another feature is this hardware stack protection. So if we want to protect our stacks in addition to our kind of mem basic regions, memory regions used by threads, we need to use a few more PMP entries. So um, in Zephyr, you have you can have an interrupt stack, you can have a a kernel mode privilege stack and a user stack. Um, so all of these we can protect, we can optionally protect with PMP if we'd like. Um, so, however, we don't necessarily need to conflict with the user mode, uh, the, the PMP uses for user mode, because once we're in kernel mode, we can save off the PMP entries for user mode, switch in our PMP entries for the kernel mode stacks. Um, so we can use them. We don't necessarily have to keep them in uh, saved in the PMP all the time. So we they they can be swapped in and out, um, at least for the IRQ stack and the kernel privilege stack. So that's the way things are done today. However, um, in Zephyr, all of these features can be enabled uh, and disabled independently. Um, so as we already saw with kconfig, we can d enable user space and power of two alignment and the hardware stack protection kind of independently. So the various combinations of all these, so care has to be taken um, in the implementation so that we support the various combinations of these features as well. And each, each entry, each of these options affects the number of PMP entries that are used and needed. Um, so yeah, so the number of stacks that are protected, the number of memory domains that are protected all are affected uh, by all these options. Um, so yeah, so just we had to take some care and, and some checking in the implementation so that we actually can support these various features uh, independently. So as hinted at um, in a couple areas, so that, that kind of covers the, the main implementation uh, overview of the implementation details. So some of the challenges that we ran into and some ideas for future work, um, well, it's the first one's not really a challenge, it's more future work. So uh, this work was focused on the 32-bit uh, RISC-V designs. Um, but uh, so some work is needed to make this work on, on RV64, and that's primarily about the low-level trap handling and so on to make sure this stuff is working for 64-bit. Um, but another area of potential interest for 64-bit is a, a lot of the RV64 designs actually support an S-mode. So like Linux uses S-mode, um, we could explore using uh, running Zephyr in S-mode and that might allow some interesting work around having, uh, uh, just like Linux, having SBI run in machine mode um, and Zephyr running in S mode. Um, so that's something we did not explore, but uh, that, that's something that's worth exploring when if we're thinking about Zephyr uh, support for a 64-bit RISC-V. Um, the other thing is this is user flag. So uh, I'm sure you may have already noticed uh, that we're just using, we're, we have to use a four bit uh, very global variable um, to check uh, this is user feature. Um, and of course that doing that that way is not SMP safe. So that right now there's only a single bit used, um, but since these cores that we're using so far are, are only single core, we haven't had this issue, but obviously we need to make that um, S that is user implementation uh, SMP safe. So one way of doing that um, that we're already exploring is since the the smallest PMP region is four bytes, uh, we there are several bits available in there. They can just have a, a bit per CPU, um, so that that can be tracked independently. Um, so that's one way of doing it, but there's definitely other work that's needed to make this uh, various parts of this implementation SMP safe. Um, so that would be relevant, especially for the RV64 support as well, because most of those are multi-core. Um, another idea that we have to explore um, is RISC-V has, has these machine trap delegation registers. Um, and so that would allow us to separate the user and kernel exception handling. So right now, um, as you may have seen, 
in my slide about the e-call handling that there's lots of stuff going on in that e-call trap handler because it has to detect kernel mode system calls, user mode system calls, um, nested e-calls uh, from various places. And so, and that's all in a single function, which is getting uh, rather large in the, in the current port. Um, so one idea we had was actually to use these delegation, w w at least we can explore is using these delegation registers. And that might allow us to clean up the code a little bit and handle kernel exception and interrupt handling separate from user exception handling. Um, that's just an idea so far. We haven't actually done that, but I, uh, we think there could be some improvements, at least in maintainability, readability of, the, of this kind of low-level code. Um, one more idea was for the QMU support. So we did some work uh, and before we were uh, designing this on the Sci-5 cores, we were doing work, uh, initial work on, on QMU. Um, and we found out that the PMP emulation actually is not f fully functional in QMU for RISC-V. So Alex actually wrote a handful of patches to QMU to support this, but there's still a bit more work that's needed to make this, uh, to support the various PMP features um, including playing with the number of slots and a, f and a few other uh, type of fe things that are enforced in hardware that are not actually enforced in QMU. So there's a bit of uh, RISC-V um, related QMU work to there. So um, uh, one other area for some future work. So that kind of wraps up uh, the talk. Uh, in, in summary, um, before we started, there was already a functional RISC-V port for Zephyr. Um, it supported uh, only the kernel mode in Zephyr, um, and it supported the cores that have just the machine mode. Um, but now after our work, we the RISC-V support for Zephyr supports user mode threads. It supports memory domains with, with protection. Um, and it also supports the hardware stack protection using all these using uh, the PMP. So thank you so much for listening, for watching. Um, we appreciate your attention. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach us here at these email addresses. Um, uh, Alex is the one who did all the, the core engineering, so he'd be the one for technical questions. Um, I can maybe help as well, but feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to talk to you about, especially around some of these ideas for future work. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, this talk was brought to you by my barking dog. I'm not sure if the, the uh, dog barking and the crows uh, behind me actually came through the recording, but uh, it was a little bit distracting, but uh, we'll just say it was, it was part of the plan. Um, and part of life as we work from home. Anyway, thank you for watching, and uh, goodbye.